Okay, uh, let's get started. So first of all, um, I would like to obviously welcome our, our main host of the show, Graham. Uh, Graham, I'll let you introduce yourself to everybody and we'll get the show yeah. started. Okay, good. Thank you. Well, welcome everybody. And uh, great to see so many of you here on this Thursday afternoon, evening, morning, wherever you are in the world. Um, we've got some really good speakers lined up for you in this session. And uh, if you've been on one of these sessions before, you know that there are some really good quality information and ideas. This one is very unique. Today's event is very unique because we live in a very unique time. And we've got here six really strong thought leaders, and I'm sure you're going to want to know what they're thinking. Just to set the scene, I would like to hand back to Salah Nazir, and he will give you some more information about some of the speakers we have coming up and how the sessions are going to run. Salah, over to you. Thank you, Graham. Thank you. And, and first of all, I mean, obviously, thank you to everyone here. I mean, it was absolutely sensational, the registrations uh, at the moment. Um, uh, absolutely unbelievable to, to, to tell you. Um, you know, we initiated this webinar last Thursday and we managed to hit approximately 150 uh, registrants uh, in a matter of just one week. Um, First of all, I'd like to thank our uh, Asian uh, partners, the people in China, Taiwan, Singapore, Malaysia. Uh, you know, you guys are staying up very late for this uh, webinar. Uh, you know, sincere appreciation uh, on our behalf and the whole semiconductor supply chain. Um, obviously, to everyone uh, on this webinar, I'd like to, uh, you know, we, I hope and I, and I wish that you, you, your families are safe in these times. Um, it's really bizarre times, really, really. Uh, unexpected uh, moments. Uh, no one could have predicted uh, the madness that this is that the world is going through. Uh, this virus has clearly brought everyone down to its knees. And um, uh, and and really, I, I hope and I pray that you are all uh, safe. Your team, your colleagues, uh, and your family members uh, as a whole uh, are safe in these times. Um, Moving forward, I mean, with regards to this webinar, uh, this is our first webinar uh, that we're holding. And, and like I mentioned earlier, um, uh, a sensational turnout already. And, uh, and I really appreciate the camaraderie of our members uh, as a whole. I'd like to thank our team uh, in specific, uh, you know, Kevin, who manages the global uh, sales team, Jubed as well, alongside Elsa as well. And of course, uh, our dearest Cindy, who runs our operations uh, globally. One thing that we've seen a huge difference in terms of our uh, work in specific is our presence in Taiwan. Uh, and we had a new colleague, uh, Mia Chen, join us uh, recently, who's done an absolutely sensational job uh, in Taiwan alongside working very, very, very closely with the Taiwanese supply chain. Uh, and, and I presume quite a, a significant uh, representatives in Taiwan are on this webinar right now. So again, I know it's 10 p.m. out there. I uh, hope your wives are not complaining. I hope your husbands are not complaining uh, as well. Um, so that, that's a, a sincere thank you on my side. Um, so let's talk about the challenges in this market, especially on our side as well. Look, the situation that we're in has really made it very difficult uh, for a physical face-to-face -face platform to happen. Um, and especially, you know, looking for, forward from now to the end of the year, uh, you know, the, the, we have to seriously look at uh, virtual conferences uh, as an alternative to ensure uh, this uh, idea exchangement um, that we're notoriously known. Of course, there is nothing like a face-to-face -face meeting. There is absolutely nothing like meeting person to person. Uh, human to human is our DNA, but the situation that we're in right now, uh, we really need to take uh, uh, virtual conferences seriously. And with the turnout that we've had, or that we have already on this webinar, uh, it, it, it's uh, really uh, a special uh, thing at the moment. So um, expect us that, you know, moving forward to the rest of the year, um, I hope that this webinar goes smooth. I hope there's no technical issues. Uh, I know there's been, uh, obviously in the news, this situation with regards to the Zoom platform um, and the lack of security behind Zoom, which I will explain in the next slide. Um, however, through the experience that I've had with webinars, through the research that my team have done, Zoom is an absolutely fantastic uh, uh, webinar in terms of the smoothness of the video, the smoothness of the audio and et cetera. Um, so on to the next slide, you'll see um, our member partners here um, in specific. Uh, I really appreciate everyone's support 
um, on the, uh, uh, globally with regards from OSATs to the IDMs, uh, to the IC design houses, to the end users. Uh, we really appreciate your support um, uh, throughout this year in specific. Our sponsor partners, um, yeah, uh, I can't explain how, you know, how grateful we are to have such great leaders, great equipment manufacturers um, supporting us uh, within these times uh, from AM, Applied Materials, Atatech, Bessie, CNW, CMAC, DAS, Evatech, EVG, Form Factor, Herewis, KLA, LAM Research, LPKF, Merck, National Instruments, Nordson, Onsemi, Onto Innovation, Pfeiffer Vacuum, Scientech, SPER, Trump, Trimax, and Y Exelon. Uh, we really appreciate your support and, and, and thank you for, for uh, you know, showing leadership in this time to, uh, and supporting us throughout the year um, for us to initiate platforms like this. So the agenda is very straightforward. It's gonna, uh, I mean, obviously this is based on Pacific Standard Timer, uh, nice and early out there. I'm sure you guys have better sun than where we are here in the UK. Uh, it starts from 7 a.m. Uh, this is my welcome address. Moving forward to, we have an incredible, incredible um, speaker lineup. I mean, uh, you know, Jackie was so grateful to have her uh, as the uh, opening presentation for us. Um, a sincere thank you to our advisory board as well uh, to, to helping this agenda, uh, agenda take place. Uh, in specific, I mean, Hamid Azimi has helped us bring uh, Jackie on board. So thank you, for Hamid, for your support on that. On Semi's uh, Farhat, again, um, thank you for being able to show us initiative uh, and, and show us how On Semi is managing this crisis at the moment. Sunil Banwari, a true supporter of ours uh, for many years. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing how ATNS is managing uh, the COVID-19 situation. CNW's Ron Glowinski, you know, a key sponsor of ours. Uh, you know, we're looking forward to hearing how, what are the logistics overview uh, and what, uh, you know, the logistics perspective um, of getting this, uh, the getting delivery happening uh, within the semiconductor industry. Tom Stokes, I mean, I don't think I need to introduce Tom Stokes. We're all very, very, very well aware of Tom at our events. Sensational speaker, sensational uh, information that he gives out there. Uh, so grateful to have Tom uh, on this uh, agenda, on this webinar. And then Mario Morales, I mean, you know, first time attendee last year, first time speaker, he came last year, delivered a fantastic presentation uh, with regards to the, the research that IDC have done uh, within, with regards to the semiconductor industry. And I'm sure many are looking forward to hearing your presentation. Now, after that, um, of course, we're going to have a, a unique networking type of breakout. Keep an eye out. There's going to be a link. Um, uh, that will be released uh, with regards uh, to how the networking will work. It will basically just juggle everyone up um, for 10 minutes. It's about 20 minutes. Um, and that will be a, a great platform to really uh, kind of try to replace the face-to-face -face feeling uh, uh, as well. So um, this is a brief outline of the speakers for today. Um, this was uh, virtually everything is possible is the theory uh, or is the uh, theme. And um, just to give you an outline in terms of the 2020 semiconductor event roadmap that we'll be running. So TSCS will still go ahead with the event on June the 1st to the 2nd. Um, you know, we're still, by the end of this month, we'll, we'll find out whether we'll go ahead physically with the event or we'll go ahead virtually with the event. Then we have our MEMS World Summit in China uh, and then, of course, uh, the main platform, CISES, on September the 5th to the 6th. Um, I also want to say thank you to all our followers as well. I mean, on LinkedIn, we've reached 10,000 followers, uh, huge supporting on LinkedIn. If you don't follow us, please go ahead and, and, and follow us and our calls uh, right now when you have your time. Um, the demographics of the attendees are as follows. So uh, the attendees um, uh, from last year, last year's event um, was, uh, is literally very similar to the registration list that we have at the moment. Uh, there are some new uh, participants as well that I'm aware of um, in uh, this webinar. So welcome uh, to ISES webinar. And that's it, thank you very much. Um, I look forward to catching up with some of you um, after this webinar is done. And um, Graham, yeah, please um, take uh, control of the show. And uh, I will looking, uh, looking forward to fantastic presentations today. And again, um, you know, 150 registrants, magnificent. Thank you for your support, everybody. 
Indeed. Thank you, Salah. And yeah, welcome, everybody. Interestingly, I love the title of this because uh, I work as a communication specialist and the last three weeks uh, I have been using every kind of platform imaginable from Zoom to Teams to Go Meeting. And um, I, I personally like Zoom, but uh, I think any way of communicating is a good one in this world today. So um, what I'd like to do is to tell you about our first speaker coming up. Um, she might be known to some of you, certainly by reputation. The company she works for will definitely have been. Jackie Strum is an uh, uh, Intel Corporate Vice President within Intel's multi-billion dollar global supply chain organization. Not only that, she's frequently recognized for high performance and as a winner of various high quality award achievement awards, uh, in fact, has been cited as, as number eight um, for eight consecutive years, sorry, has been cited for eight consecutive years in the Gartner Supply Chain Top 25. So Jackie knows a lot, as you say. In fact, she knows more than I would imagine most people in her field. So I'd like to welcome Jackie. Now, just before we hand over to Jackie, um, the way the format of these presentations go is this. I will invite each of the speakers to talk through their points for around 10 minutes or so. And uh, then after that, I shall open it up to the attendees to ask questions. Now, the easiest way to ask questions is through the Q&A uh, facility in your toolbar. And this will be at the edge of your screen at the top or bottom, depending on how you've configured your Zoom login. So please listen carefully to each of the speakers and make those really important questions as they come through. Okay, so. Salah, I think you might need to make Jackie a, a speaker there, a panelist. So if you click on, uh, just click on Jackie's name and. Yep, it's, it, 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 it should be working now. It should be working now. Right, panelist. Jackie, hello, can you hear me? So Jackie, you just need to unmute on your side or do we unmute, do we help that? There we go. Yeah, Jackie, we can, we should be able to hear you right now. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we do. Jackie, okay. good, good afternoon. Hello. I apologize if I've missed anything off your illustrious, illustrious CV, but and we will all wait to hear you speak. So please um, fill in any gaps I've missed. Thank you, Jackie. It's a pleasure. I'm having a little trouble with the screen. Um, so just give me one moment here. Um, it's it's fine, Jack. We'll, we'll have we'll, we'll we can manage, if you can see the screen. We have your PPT uh, uh, in front of us, so we'll manage it for you on our side. So if you you can just simply just say next, and we'll move to the next slide. Okay, uh, that's fine. Thank you. Um, and good morning, good evening, good afternoon to all of you who are here today on the call. Thank you for having me. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to meet with you and share some of the work that's being done at Intel. Um, I also want to echo the well wishes that have been uh, sent to all of you. Um, I know that this is a trying time and I hope that each of you are um, managing with your families to be uh, happy and healthy while we grapple with this unprecedented situation. So for today, I want to talk with you a little bit about how Intel operates its business continuity program from the standpoint of our supply chain and how we're leveraging our playbook to tackle the new challenges that are presented to us from this pandemic. If I can go to the next page, please. At the end of the day, what you see here is our business continuity model. And in its simplest form, what business continuity represents to us at Intel is being well prepared to continue to deliver uninterrupted supply regardless of the obstacles. And so at Intel, over the last 30 years, we've developed and hardened this simple but pretty effective framework to do exactly that. And you can see our process on the diagram on the left. It starts with the fact that business continuity is embedded in the way we run our business. It's not just an add-on or something extra that we do. It's part of our baseline operating approach. It's how 
we qualify suppliers. It's how we measure suppliers. It's how we uh, test ourselves to ensure that we're ready for whatever may happen. The second and third points are what illustrate that. Uh, the most critical part of this model is that we have a mindset that failure can never be an option. And as a result, this drives a very action-oriented problem-solving approach um, as opposed to one that's seeking permission and going through a lot of um, overhead uh, to deliver on the actions that we have to take to keep the business running. It's very dynamic, but it's in a framework that's very structured and um, systematic. And also, because every disaster is different, no so solution is going to be guaranteed to succeed every time. So we are continuously fine tuning this approach. But the important point is that we don't stop because we might fail on a particular tactic. We go in, we try to get the answer, figure out why it might not be working, learn from that, iterate, and take new and improved approaches. And then we document those. We're constantly innovating and fine tuning. We're learning and we're incorporating new knowledge and new approaches into our overall program because they might be useful in some other situation, we want to make sure that we uh, institutionalize those learnings. So with everything that we've learned, um, using our playbook and ensuring our supply chain teams can respond quickly and effectively means that we have to do drills. And those drills are taking realistic cases that we've outlined based on either current business conditions or high impact risks or uh, potential future issues. And then we run table exercises with 50 to 100 percent, 100 of our senior leaders. And then we document what we learned. And we do after action processes to make sure that we really got something out of where we weren't effective. That after action process is one I strongly recommend. It's the most valuable tool to make sure you get visibility into what worked, what didn't work, and where you might have to innovate or improve um, in a variety of ways. Uh, were there any new tools that were, are available that can help us? Are there any new situations where what worked in this situation might not be effective? And how do we prepare ourselves to um, identify those in the process of uh, triaging the issues? So all of this is then institutionalized for our teams and into our playbook. Uh, for all of us to improve our approaches. And that playbook is something that our teams are trained on and uh, routinely um, are shared with our suppliers as well in certain cases. It's not just our team, that collective team of our overall supply chain, our R&D organization, our manufacturing team, sales and marketing, as well as our suppliers. So as we do these drills routinely throughout the variety of challenges that we face, um, it allows us to harden our business continuity processes and make them instinctual. Lastly, um, but most importantly, management commitment is at the center of business continuity. Intel's board of directors, our CEO, the CFO, and all of supply chain leadership have to care deeply and visibly uh, about this because the tone from the top is what translates into your employees' priorities, into your processes, and into your readiness for what might hit you. For us, the two top priorities are employee safety and customer support. And those translate directly into how we conduct all of our supply chain operations, not just business continuity, but certainly including business continuity. If I can go to the next page, I'd like to kind of illustrate the situation that we find ourselves in today. What I have here is what we call the waves of COVID-19. And um, what you can see is that we have seen an accelerating expansion of risk. And I know that all of you have been living it. Um, and this, I think, is a much more significant challenge than the other disasters I've faced in my career. Uh, but the approaches that we've taken um, historically still continue to serve us well, but the pace of innovation is perhaps a little more rapid than we've experienced in prior times. If you look at the original outbreak of COVID-19, it was confined to China. And most disasters, I think, that most of us have experienced, certainly me, um, they tend to be bounded. They might be time-bounded, or they're country-bounded, or they're bounded by a certain commodity area or an individual factory. 
you know, maybe there's been an earthquake, maybe there's been a, a transportation disaster or what have you. But what's happened with COVID-19 has just come at us in progressively bigger waves. Each successive wave has built on the prior issues while we're still dealing with the prior issues and it's expanded both the breadth and the depth of the challenges that we're facing, as well as compounded the complexity of the issues we have to address. No government, no group of governments have the same set of regulations, no health authority is applying the same solutions, no uh, supply base is you know, equally um, concerned about the issues. And so our ability to respond has come from observing the environment, applying our continuous learning, and building on what we were able to do effectively in prior waves. By leveraging what we learned in China, for example, about how to interact with uh, federal and provincial governments, um, by learning uh, in China how we could prepare suppliers for change as uh, that began to dynamically evolve as we learned how to address travel restrictions in a way that still allowed us to do our business, um, integrating with our international suppliers and field support. And by using all of that successive um, compounding data, we've gotten faster at responding to each successive change. Uh, the situation that we've experienced in China allows us to translate that knowledge into uh, Germany, into France, into Italy, as well as into some of the other countries in Asia, and now uh, in the United States, where we have even more dispersion of regulatory environments and solutions. But as I see it, this is a situation that if it was like prior experiences, it would have been a sprint. But this sprint has surprisingly transformed itself into a marathon. I think we're at 12 weeks and counting since the first Hubei uh, shutdowns. And in this sprint, also known as a marathon, we found that you can only win if you're conditioned and you're ready to adapt. So that's what we hope we are doing. So to implement our program, I'd like to look at this next page. And what this outlines is our rapid mobilization of business continuity. I think Intel has uniquely prepared itself for this situation. Um, for supply chain, um, what you see in the center is we have our own rapid mobilization model um, with a, a war room that's a cornerstone of our supply chain portion of that process. We've developed a business continuity playbook years ago, and based on what we know from uh, early warning systems, uh, that triggered us to activate our war room for supply chain in mid-January. And this was the very early stages of people understanding what was going on in the Wuhan quarantine, as well as the potential scope of the issues that were in front of us. So this was well before I think most people were activating their programs. Um, this war room is a tool that we use. We meet twice daily with our top supply chain leadership and any critical subject matter experts and people maybe from other business continuity teams across the company who are looking for supply chain support. And it's this model that allows us to have real-time robust communication across our own uh, globally distributed organization to problem solve together, identify what help might be needed, make sure that we have tracking for any follow-ups that are required, and then we crystallize the types of communication that we will share with our suppliers, with our customers, and the internal factories and business units of Intel. And as you can see, it's not just us in the supply chain that is uh, shown in the gold color, it's Intel's overall uh, construct. Our corporate approach to respond to emergencies is extremely well-structured and comprehensive. One of the key elements that's front and center today is the item you see on the far left of this page, and that's our pandemic leadership team. I don't know how many companies have a pandemic leadership team, but for us, we established this over 15 years ago when the first SARS epidemic was occurring. And although there haven't been any pandemics since then, um, we thought it was important to maintain this capability since the potential for such a situation remained and obviously um, was unresolved. So this group is comprised of medical and safety experts, public affairs teams who work with government, 
and that's alongside operational experts, including the supply chain. It's deeply equipped to orchestrate across the corporation on how we need to respond internally to ensure the health and safety of our entire workforce and the continued operations of our company. Global supply chain is at the heart of this overall corporate model, and we connect closely with all of our internal partners. But in particular, we work with sales and marketing to understand the changing needs of our customers, you know, who might be changing their demand because of issues that they're facing, who might be accelerating their demand, et cetera. We work with our internal factories to ensure support for ongoing production. And we work very, very tightly and significantly with the public affairs and legal teams as we grapple with the government restrictions and emerging policies uh, to ensure that we're in compliance everywhere but also to um, conduct appeals that might be needed as appropriate. And we've definitely had to stretch those muscles in the course of this particular situation. Additionally, uh, the supply chain creates the external links that are required to deliver to our internal needs. So we maintain close relationships to our suppliers and our customers, and we communicate status and needs on a, a daily, if not more frequent basis with our suppliers, either through uh, supplier.intel.com, where we post a lot of information about emerging policies, or directly through our commodity team. Um, we work to make sure that they know how we're protecting their workforce when they may be working on our sites or uh, on our issues. And then also to share uh, what emerging needs might be required from them on uh, uh, workforce management or other particulars. So due to the global integrated nature of Intel's overall supply chain, no single organization has a total line of sight to each of the business continuity areas. So we use an active communication framework via the war room, and that leverages what uh, solutions might have been identified to work in um, back-end equipment, for example, and applies them to our front-end equipment areas, or uh, more broadly, if they're applicable to new disruptions or other organizations. And we do this um, reuse, recycle, rather than reinvent the wheel every time. We don't want every commodity team or every account manager to have to design their own solution. Um, and if you know Intel, you know copy exactly is a foundational principle. But where we don't have a, a model, where we have nothing in place, our collective team gets together in the war room to invent a new wheel, and then we use it as broadly as possible. Um, and ultimately, the focus is on how we can assist our partners and our suppliers so that we minimize the disruptions to our customers as the pandemic con continues. Just a couple of examples I can share with you about solutions that we've had to apply um, in this particular situation. It's most important to us that we ensure workforce safety, and that's our own employees or the employees of our suppliers should they be on, on our sites. And in the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we were closely engaged with uh, the governments in China and their health organizations to define the conditions and the personal protective equipment that was required for our employees to work safely and to um, comply with gov government regulations that would allow us to continue to operate. During the China situation, the government mandated that all employees had to wear masks and they had a frequency um, metric at which the masks had to be changed. That left us with a requirement of over 4 million masks per month. And I'm sure that you all know supply tended to dry up very quickly when it wasn't coming out of China and uh, India had put some embargoes on uh, mask exports. So after scouring the world for supply, we managed to find a volume supplier in South America. And as we were trying to lock that in, we thought that was available to us, one and a half million units. Someone else swooped in with cash and took that supply. So we learned from that, we need to make advance payments and make sure that nobody uh, jumps the gun on us. But then another government embargoed the movement of the next set of masks that we had found. So we had to move to sourcing smaller and smaller quantities with different alternative suppliers. But by not taking failure as an option and staying tenacious in pushing to find a supply, we were able to continuously support our factory requirements. And I want to say that our factories in China operated throughout the entire pandemic. We were never shut down except for the first couple of days. And this effort allowed us to continue operations and um, 
maintained a process that we were able to leverage as we moved to more and more countries, uh, where in advance we've established buffer inventories and prepared for additional regulation. The next situation was global travel restrictions. As they cascaded into place with different restrictions in a variety of countries, we had to become inventive in the approaches we took to have supplier field service engineers available to support our equipment in our factories. As we saw the lockdowns near our factories in Chengdu and Dalian, we understood that it was critical to get key supplier personnel into the right countries very early on. And so what we started doing was uh, staging uh, people. We knew there was a 14-day mandatory quarantine for international travelers. So we were getting supply personnel into the right countries in advance so that they could go through the quarantine and be ready for that next step of preventive maintenance. Where we couldn't have suppliers travel, we used technology to enable virtual reality and online training sessions uh, in which remote experts, the people at the supplier, certified our local employees uh, via Zoom meetings or other uh, techniques like uh, virtual reality, as I mentioned, and GoPro. Um, and that allowed them to certify our local employees to work on our advanced equipment, your advanced equipment, without breaching the warranty clauses. And because we've experienced so many situations with logistics disruptions, just to name a few, snowstorms in Shanghai, volcanoes in Iceland, Japanese tsunamis, our logistics team is always looking for danger. And so they jumped into action to lock in charter capacity very early. And I mean, very early January, when we started engaging to establish a capacity model to support material and product movement. Um, just having the capacity, which they had locked in through uh, charters, for example, that wasn't enough. Some of the routes were no longer allowed and landing permissions were revoked by countries and regulators. So we worked to establish alternative transfer, transportation routes very quickly. We partnered with IT to update our SAP systems on a route by route basis as we needed so that we could enable the capacity we could get uh, when the capacity we had planned wasn't available. Now, the great metric is while we've seen greater than a 90% drop in global freight capacity in some locations, at the same time, due to our advanced engagement, Intel is achieving greater than 95% on-time customer delivery with all impacts minimized to less than 48 hours. And up to the India uh, lockdown, it was less than 24 hours, but uh, we've continued to respond and evolve, and I'm still pretty happy with this kind of response time. Now, all of these processes are great, but they don't mean that we're going to always get everything we want, no matter how hard we work at it. Therefore, we have pre-established trade-offs in priority order in terms of types of products that can be shifted or reallocated, types of commodities we can substitute, projects that can be reprioritized over others so that we can achieve something when we can't achieve everything. And this allows us to systematically concentrate our efforts and deliver on the most critical areas to our customers. Our focus on advanced preparation, rapid mobilization, and coordinated actions um, is, I think, something that has served us pretty well so far. Uh, our customers will tell the tale when we announce our earnings at the end of April, but I'm very proud of the team and the work we've done so far. So let me close on slide five. And here I wanna say to all of the leaders on the call, I know that you're all focused on keeping up with the daily challenges that this particular crisis is presenting you. However, I recommend that you work to take advantage of what you're learning today during this crisis and leverage those learnings to do things to transform your business continuity processes for the future, to redefine your standards and prepare yourself better for what comes in the future. During crises is when you really, really learn how your supply chain truly works, what are its strengths and its weaknesses, and by taking the time to build on the strengths and shore up the weaknesses, you'll be better able to cope with whatever comes your way in the future, and I assure you there is more coming. So thank you for your time today, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Jackie, fantastic. Thank you so much. And truly impressive, truly impressive, as Intel is. Can I ask a first question, if I may? Please send your questions through the Q&A button at the bottom or top of your screen. What is it, do you have, Jackie, a, a number in your head for the number of Intel employees or indeed um, customer endpoints in your organization, just to give a scale of what you've achieved in the last three months? 
I'm sorry, I don't understand what you mean by customer. How many, how many employees are there in Intel, roughly? Would, would you know? 100,000 in Intel. That's extra extraordinary. Uh, and you said that was one of the most prime priorities for you. Um, how quickly did you react, Jackie, when you, when you saw this on the horizon at, at Intel? Did you, were you an early responder to this crisis or have you Well, I'll miracles? tell you that yeah. we triggered our business continuity uh, team, um, our, our global team on January 27th, and we implemented our twice daily 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. war room on January 29th. Um, yeah. In early January, our logistics team um, was already in action. So I'd say most organizations were really just waking up to the situation, but we started yeah. at, at the late part of January. Okay, well, that, that was pretty, pretty early, I think. Okay, I've got a question here. Um, do you see any impact on the Intel business because of the COVID-19? from a demand point of view, do you think the demand for Intel products will decrease or increase as a result of the virus? Well, one thing that's been interesting in um, you know, all of the government discussions, um, although many businesses are shut down, it has been consistently agreed that semiconductors and um, uh, critical networking type businesses are essential uh, industries. And I think they're essential because this is how the world runs. Uh, cloud service providers require servers, require networking, require, you know, um, ISPs to have great telecom equipment and users want high powered uh, connectivity tools and very responsive compute capability. So my anticipation is that the demand for high performance compute is only going to increase. Yeah. Um, but I think we will see there are tremendous headwinds also relative to uh, the potential for consumer spending and you know with the um, unemployment and other uh, fallout that comes from the crisis it remains to be seen but i think in its purest sense the demand for high performance compute capability is only getting stronger yes all right all right really interesting um i'm going to ask you to pause there because we've got some, many other speakers but jackie thank you again uh, really interesting points and if any of you have other questions can you please keep sending them through and we will try and get Jackie to answer them at some point over the next couple of days. Uh, thank you, Jackie. Thank Good. you. Um, now, next speaker coming up is uh, Farhat Yahangia. Have I said that correctly, sir? Perfectly fine. Oh, thank you. I, I think you may just be being kind to my strange English accent. Um, stunning career, a massive background, a master in science degree, electrical engineering, moved through supply chain networks, um, responsible for um, many margin improvements over the years. And today is VP of Manufacturing and General Manager at East Fishkill. Uh, he joined on Semiconductor through an acquisition uh, very recently, but has spent six years uh, with a previous organization. So um, Fahad, please over to you. And we're very interested to hear your views on this, uh, this topic today. Thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate the platform uh, that you guys have provided uh, and then uh, uh, made us, you know, enabling us to talk and then convey our message through this very difficult time around the world. Um, my focus of uh, uh, the presentation today uh, is not purely from the supply chain business continuation point of view. It is the impact of COVID-19 COVID and our business continuity. So as uh, I believe that Jackie did a great job in, in, in presenting uh, what the, uh, our pillars of supply chain, uh, where we semiconductor world focuses uh, and then our business continuation. So my uh, presentation will be focused on this, the reaction of the COVID-19. What, what are the steps that on semiconductor has taken um, to make sure that the business continues and then the, when the, the global pandemic situation is under control, how fast we can recover. So if you go to the uh, slide, next slide. So, uh, so as, uh, as you know, the first case was announced uh, by China. The first declaration was done by China on, on December 31st. And around mid-January, uh, 
we became aware of the situation, what is happening around the world, or what is happening, especially uh, that was focused on China, as Jackie mentioned, waves uh, of uh, COVID, and then the wave one was only in China. And then uh, uh, our uh, on semiconductor is a is a is a a big company. We have a global footprint. We have 36,000 employees, and out of that, almost 30,000 employees are only in our manufacturing related. We have fabs and assembly houses all around the world. So with this wave one, we also, uh, China wave, we also uh, felt that uh, very strongly that there is something going on and this is going to be uh, coming out of China fast soon. So by end of January, we put our uh, team together uh, uh, to see how can we uh, uh, react to this one and how can we make sure our business continues uh, business continues globally. Uh, so in this regard, uh, as Jackie was mentioning, the war room, we have a situation room uh, the, where, where the global business continuity teams meet multiple times a week. Actually, we do have meetings in the hallway also uh, to make sure that everyone is aware of that. Well, this is not only in the corporate head office or the supply chain controls, this is, which is in Phoenix, this is also all the manufacturing sites, the local uh, uh, sites that we have around the factories. We have a business continuation, continuity team also there is also. Um, so those teams are working and then reporting. The factory teams are working and reporting almost on daily basis to the our central team. And central team, the situation uh, room that I mentioned, is we are uh, very closely monitoring the situation of where is this, uh, our supply chain uh, dashboard through the dashboarding. Where are the situation? Where are the uh, supply chain um, uh, lags are, or the areas we need to address it uh, urgently? This is not new because we are because of the global fit footprint. Uh, this is our practice over a decade or so, decade or so that where we have a, a business continu uh, continuity plans and global pandemic reaction plan. Uh, how we adjust our situ our business uh, to address that one. And this COVID-19 is one uh, situation which became pandemic. And if you, if you know that we have multiple epidemic situations also sometime can be uh, in an earthquake in Taiwan or maybe some other geopolitical situation in, in any different country. So we have to make sure that we have the teams and then we have our supply chain in such a a, a form that where we have uh, a, a dual source or multiple source, and then do we qualify our fab technology, a mirror, mirror fab, whatever we are producing in fab one, do we have a mirror in fab two or fab three or fab four or different areas? Same as the assembly situation, is it uh, qualified in one product, qualified in one assembly only, or is qualified in multiple assemblies to make sure if there is a situation like this, how can we react? Uh, second, and the last bullet is very important, is the communication, communication, communication. Uh, the last thing you want is the customer uh, interruption and any communication to your customer. And then there's, as we have a multiple channels established with our, all of our customers where we do our communication. And some of the uh, information is also available on our website. Uh, we have a special uh, coronavirus uh, alert uh, daily basis. We update that. Next slide, please. So in so th this is a very, very important uh, part. The absolutely number one priority that we have is health and safety of our employees. Um, so moment this issue happened, we right away, we form our team, as I mentioned earlier, is how are we going to be reacting? When it's situation, this was locally initially for China and then became other uh, countries outside China and then became global uh, footprint of how are we going to be reacting to make sure our business continues and our customer receives uh, the part they're uninterrupted. So we encourage our employees to work from home wherever is appropriate. Um, I can give a very quick example of the fab that I am responsible of here in East Fishkill, New York, is all our management or finance, HR, non-technical fab related people, we encourage them to work from home. And then even in the fab area, we have established different groups to make sure how we're going to be reacting when there is a situation happens and if there is a, anything appears. Uh, we increase our cleaning frequency. 
Uh, we have different shifts coming in. We separated, divided over employees into different phases where when, it, when the group one comes in and then before the leaving cleaning crew starts cleaning up uh, the doorknobs and other stuff areas that supposed to be cleaned their surfaces and second uh, uh, group comes in. We try our level, trying our level best to make sure our group one is not um, completely, uh, doesn't have any exposure to, with group two. So things like that, we have implementing it. We have implemented travel restrictions as soon, faster than the, the, some of the reactions the US government has done. We did faster reactions, travel restrictions. Um, health screening, every entrance is, all of our factories have full health screening. We do the temperature testing. We encourage employees to wear uh, gloves, um, um, desanitize their hand, put their gloves on and put the mask on. Every factory we have for that uh, implemented. Uh, we are also minimizing visitors. We are visitors are, are mostly no face-to-face -face meeting. Uh, the, all the meetings are only through uh, the sources that we are using right now, Zoom and WebEx and all other uh, uh, source available today. Uh, and then uh, also we are handling everything case by case uh, to make sure that that we minimize the the uh, any exposure impact to our employees. That is our number one goal. Uh, next slide. So supply chain situation is you know. As uh, Jackie mentioned you know, in very great detail is semiconductor manufacturing supply chain is not straightforward. It is very dynamic. Uh, and then uh, we have in and on semiconductor, we have taken a lot of steps to make sure that we minimize the impact as much as possible. So we are monitoring um, and partnering with our suppliers to make sure our uh, raw material is available, make sure our, we, 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 it's not uh, on semiconductor, we have almost 70%, more than 70% of our manufacturing is in-house. We have around 30% manufacturing, external manufacturing. So it is very important for us to not only to make sure our supply chain is running, our factories are running as um, um, you know, high throughput as possible, it's at the same time our manufacturing partners that we are third, third uh, 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 manufacturing partners, external manufacturing partners also uh, uh, aware of our situation, our requirement, and then uh, how they are reacting to that. So it is, it's a very close working relationship. Uh, great thing is that everyone is feeling it at the same time and everyone is aware of that situation and they are helping uh, uh, in a great deal uh, to one another. So not only that, we are working very closely with our logistic partners also uh, to make sure how we're gonna be moving our material uh, freight routes. Is it through air if possible, if not through ground and through ship. So wherever is all the possibilities um, that we evaluate and then we already have lined up uh, to make sure that we see as minimum uh, impact as possible. Uh, and of course, and then they quickly adjust as the situation changes. That is uh, absolutely, we are, we are the, the, the business we are in, the reaction is absolutely important for us. So it's not only a reaction, so because supply chain, especially business continuation is make sure that we proactively work uh, to, to, uh, to, uh, to take care of the supply chain situation. But even if in case we cannot correctly work, we, because there, are, there will be cases coming in where we have to react it. So, so the reaction makes sure how fast we take care of the reaction is also very important. Next slide, please. So this is absolutely very, very important. So I will request that the platforms like uh, this platform that we are using right now to communicate and we use uh, uh, Sala, your platform at the same time, all these available industry platforms to make sure we, uh, we uh, our lawmakers in around the world in different countries are aware of the semiconductor business situation, how this works. Because this pandemic um, is, is, is very different and then it is around, it's a pandemic, so it's around the world. And then there are, we have seen, as Jackie also mentioned, that different countries have imposed different reactions to that one and different restrictions 
reactions to their export or import, uh, making sure how they will be reacting to this uh, situation in their country. So, um, and then we are already working very closely with different, um, you know, uh, by, we are abiding by different laws of different countries. At the same time, we make sure that we educate our lawmakers, lawmakers uh, through our industry association and uh, through our own activities. Uh, and it is absolutely, absolutely critical for our industries, semiconductor industry, to make sure that we uh, uh, we, we increase uh, criticality during this pandemic, right? Uh, so it is absolutely very, very important for us to communicate to lawmakers how can we react and how can we move forward fast when this uh, is over. And even if it's not over, how are we going to be reacting during this time? Not only that, the lawmakers of the country, we are also local lawmakers, we are also making working with them. So I think this platform can be very, very important for us to use to educate our lawmakers. So I would encourage you to have invite our government officials also where we can talk or some of our industry leaders can talk to them and explain to them what our requirements are in, in terms of uh, um, if there is a situation like this, uh, if, if it stays longer or if it comes in a wave two. So um, uh, next slide. So, uh, so the response summary is uh, while the situation has been, um, you know, changing uh, constantly every day, numbers are changing. You know, uh, yesterday numbers were around 400,000 in U.S. only, and today they're almost 400, touching 450,000 uh, positive cases. Um, you know, unfortunately, deaths are also at rise. So, so semiconductor has been, um, and, and and you know we, so. It is semiconductor industry is is also feeling the reaction of whatever the situation is happening uh, in the, around the world. Um, luckily, so far in the in the factory we are that I'm running here is is running uninterruptedly, no no uh, issue uh, yet, uh, and I hope that we don't see it because of a lot of health related uh, in, uh, measures that we have taken to make sure we continue our business as we did. Um, and then as most of the, um, uh, as almost every company in the world, likely what we're seeing where we will have an impact from this pandemic, uh, we are working very hard around the clock to make sure we minimize the impact to our customers as much as possible. So actually I have more slides, but I will just uh, st uh, stop here because the rest of the slides are our uh, general business continuation uh, format. And I think more uh, right now the topic is, uh, COVID-19 related, so I will stay here. If there's a question, fine, otherwise we'll answer the question at the end of the presentation. Okay, Farhat, thank you so much. Um, and I like the idea there of involving local government lawmakers. Uh, and, I, and I suspect, as you say, we are only at the beginning of, of the changes that we all experience from this. We have a question here. Um, would somebody like to, uh, this is for instance, uh, like to ask this live? I think we can do this. Um, would you, would you, um, perhaps not, let me just read this out for you. Um, do you see any disruption in the back end or packaging supply chain as some of on some of these factories is located in China and other parts of Asia? Also, do you see any supply chain issue with the OSAT partners? Now those are two so, big questions. So Farhat, if you could give us your answer, that would be lovely. Yes, this is actually a very good question. Um, definitely, we do have uh, uh, supply chain or our OSAC factories, uh, assembly and test uh, packaging factories in China and also other part of the world. Uh, and initially, we uh, we had a small uh, supply chain hiccup when the China was uh, completely locked down, but our factories were never shut down. Uh, we were running it at the at a lower level. Um, uh, throughput was uh, was extremely low, but uh, as of today, uh, all of our China factories are 100% to capacity. Uh, we are seeing some uh, impact in, in outside China uh, assembly uh, and packaging assembly and test area, but we are working with the government, as I mentioned, that it is absolutely important for us to work with the government to make sure that they are aware of the, the our uh, industry compared to some other factories, how our employees work, how, because for example, if there's a fab, everyone is very clean room environment is every everyone is already in and then particle free so the germs are are also very uh, unlikely to get in so some of the assembly areas we raised it raised the bar of the cleanliness of the, of the putting the mask on and then the gloves on and 
So we educated our, our uh, lawmakers and uh, so far, so good. So far we are running uh, fine. We, are, we have some, it's not, we are not running to full capacity outside China yet, but we are um, in a good shape today. Okay, excellent. Well, that's good, good to hear, Fire. Thank you. And likewise, if, you, if anybody in the room uh, has any other questions, please send them over. So now I'd like to move on to our next speaker is Sunil Bawari. Uh, Sunil is a Chief uh, Operating Officer and Managing Director of AT&S India, PBT Limited. Now he's got over 30 years in international leadership experience um, with 20 years in the US and 10 years in Asia. And I think that makes him extremely well qualified to share some of his thoughts and um, yeah, predictions, I think, for, for where we are today in these strange times. So Sunil, can I hand you over the audience, please? And uh, we can put the slides up for you. Excellent. Okay, um, thanks. Can you hear me? Yes? Yes, I can hear you fine, Sunil. Okay. Yes. So thanks for the kind intro. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think uh, this crisis really brings up the point which was made in the old Chinese curse. May you, li may you live in interesting times. I think the person who came, came up with it probably didn't realize how interesting it would be. So anyway, with uh, no further ado, I'll start dig right into ATNS. So probably many of you may not have heard of ATNS. So I'll just do a quick uh, introduction. Next slide, please. So what is ATNS? Uh, we, are, we provide high-end interconnect solutions for mobile, automotive, industrial, medical. And as far as high-end PCBs, we pro basically are number one. And uh, we are over a billion dollars in revenues. We are among the top five PCB producers globally, over 10,000 employees. And uh, again, nowhere as large as the two previous uh, presenters. Uh, we have big shoes to fill, but uh, Again, we have an efficient uh, global production footprint with six plants in Europe and Asia. And I'll talk a little bit about how we learn from each other in this crisis. Next, please. So just to give an idea of the global reach of ATNS, our headquarters is in Austria, and uh, we have two factories in Austria, two in China, and uh, one in Korea, and then one in India. So basically, uh, you can see that really our global footprint gave us a lot of opportunity to learn from each other as the COVID crisis uh, spread from one country to the next. Um, next, please. Yeah, so what we learned from each other, again, we have a crisis management team, business continuity processes, which are pretty world class when I compare it to the previous presenters. And we learned from each other pretty early on. Uh, I'll take an easy example, which is the masks. So if you recall, there's a lot of debate, especially in the United States and a few other countries on the whether, whether masks are required or not, especially the N95, given the short supply. And I think even now there's still some debate, but I think the issue is mostly settled, where people are basically convinced that masks do something positive. And so we took that learning to heart. So we didn't wait for the governments to announce in each geography that we need to wear masks. We learned from each other. And we started with masks well before the government, say in India or uh, Korea, was asking us to put masks on. So really, this is something which helped us stay ahead of the curve. So when the governments actually came, came in with their regulatory requirements, we were already ahead of the curve. And uh, this is something which is actually, uh, again, in, uh, the, the compliance is a key part of it. Uh, and we actually, in some sites, we have disciplinary action which applies in the case that uh, these processes are not followed, because as you know, in some countries, compl compliance has been an issue. Uh, body temperature measurement, I think that's pretty standard in all sites. Uh, obligations to wear masks even when you carpool or in buses. And uh, really making sure you don't wait for them to get the masks mask when they come to the site, but have to have them available even before they get on the bus ride when they're in the queue. So there is no, they maintain the social distancing all along. Uh, finally, I think the quarantine regulations were very key, uh, making sure not just in Austria, which is where we, uh, we basically identified the original requirements, but this also all sites are implying uh, quarantine regulations. If I look at ATNS India, uh, we implemented back in early February uh, the, the uh, tr guidelines for tra uh, travelers especially, which was well before, I think exactly one month before the government asked us to do something. Next. 
Uh, business trips stopped. I think this is all pretty standard, so I will skip quickly through the common practices at other sites. Uh, visits from external parties uh, done through video telephone conferencing, uh, meetings through video telephone conferencing, home office. Uh, I think this is something uh, a lot of us realize. A lot of the jobs which we said could not be done through home office are be beginning to look more and more doable through home office. So it's really changing the paradigm where positions which were not considered to be home office based in the past are now actually showing the feasibility. And I think this is a learning pretty much all companies are having. Next. Uh, spatial protective measures, I think, I think this is key. And this is where I think we had a lot of dialogue. I would constantly be on the phone with my counterparts in Korea and China. Uh, open doors on highly frequented paths. Again, the act of really touching, the, doing the access cards, uh, touching the door knobs, making sure that the doors are open, kept open permanently. Now, this does create some security pitfalls, which we also have to address, and we did. But uh, again, making sure that minimize any contact wherever possible. Increased cleaning on the door handles. Uh, sensitive areas would be disinfected. In fact, uh, we did the disinfection of our site uh, when we restarted after a very short gap of a few days. Uh, but we did it before the government asked us to do. So this is, again, something was learning from other sites. And then the guideline came along from the government that we need to do this. We didn't have to shut down because we had already done it. Uh, we also doing it, uh, doing the disinfectant dispensers throughout the plant and uh, deactivating the fan dryers, going with the paper dispensers. Next. More on spatial protective measures. So uh, especially canteen is a key area, making sure wherever there's uh, opportunity for increased uh, mingling, to have restrictions on how many people can sit per table, having glass partitions between the two people uh, sitting across from each other on the table, reducing the seating, seating staggering the lunch breaks, uh, making the meals uh, basically, uh, again, a lot of requirements where we safety distance between tables, maintaining the requirement uh, with, well before the government actually requested us to do that. Uh, reconstruction measures in the break room, dismantling the bar tables, which used to be areas where people would get together and uh, talk and have tea. Uh, distance marking at the smoking areas as well, making sure even in the smoking areas there were enough floor markings to maintain the safety distance. Next. So I think this one, I'll probably spend a little bit more time because we are right in the middle of it. So as you know, in ATNS India, the lockdown started pretty much uh, two, three weeks ago. So this was a nationwide lockdown followed by a statewide lock lockdown. And it was really challenging uh, in the sense that they both are, um, happened with, with pretty little notice. But because of the fact that we had prepared well, I think this saw us through a lot of, uh, uh, this gave us a lot of advantage in dealing with this. But even with that, we had an issue which uh, no one had planned for. And I'd like, I'd like to hear from the other panelists if you have seen another an issue like this. But this definitely took us by surprise and uh, led the foundation for more learning. So what was this issue? Uh, let me get to the next. I think it's a build up, so you'll have to keep clicking. So what if the company next door to your factory has a COVID outbreak? So this is exactly what happened to us. And again, for the reasons of privacy, we will not mention the company next to us, but it was, it's safe to say it's not in the semiconductor electronics industry, but they had a major COVID-19 outbreak and they were actually became an epicenter uh, within the state we live in. They, uh, almost half the cases came from that factory. Now we were within one kilometer radius of the red zone. So to give you an idea, uh, the distance from door to door is around 650 meters. So when the one kilometer radius was implemented, we were clearly out of luck. That factory shut down for uh, un uh, for an uh, uh, unspecified amount of time and we are in the same boat. If we, do, if we did nothing, we would be in the same boat. So what did we actually do? And again, let me talk a little bit more about the challenges. Next. Sorry, again, please be patient since you have to click through one by one. Uh, implications were, okay, the government may shut down the area, entire area down for any traffic affecting employees and goods movement, which is what they did. So for us, we lost any opportunity to transport employees and goods through the, to, the fa to the site and beyond because of the factory next to us. Next. Employees and suppliers cannot come. So there's also a social element to it because even though the government regulations are the first barrier, again, uh, in a country like India, where, which is a free press, uh, there's a lot of nonstop television and news around the world, around the clock. And basically, everybody knows in your family, in society, 
that this issue has happened at your neighbor. So imagine that our employees and suppliers are unable to come because their families are challenging them. Why, why do you need to go to work to this uh, red zone? So that's another challenge. Next. So what, what are the key actions? What can we do in this case? And I think uh, it's surprising actually when we look at it in hindsight that we were successful in addressing uh, what seems to be an insurmountable challenge. The first, some of the actions we did, uh, if you keep building, please. Uh, we changed the focus of the factory. So we are primarily a company which is focused on, in India on automotive and industrial. But we switched to medical products almost immediately. Now we were fortunate because as you know, there's a worldwide shortage of ventilators. And India started a COVID-19 task force, which happened to be headquartered in the very same city where we are based. So as the only PCB company in this four company initiative, which is part of the nationwide task force, we were asked to provide the PCBs, the print circuit boards. Although again, just to be clear, ATNS does more than PCBs. We do modules, we do uh, substrates for semiconductors. Uh, so we are doing a wide range of technologies, but for this particular project, we were providing print circuit boards. And the key thing about this initiative is the ventilator design, which we were building in this city where we are based is the reference design for the whole industry. So a host of big name companies were out there building this ventilator. And the demand from the government of India was 100,000 ventilators. So that's what we had to gear up to build. So based on the fact that we were building what became a mission critical project, uh, we actually had constant dialogue with the government. They clearly did not want us to shut down, but they also realized the challenge that we are within the red zone. So one thing we agreed to do mutually was we excluded employees from the red zone from factory attendance until they are fully tested for COVID. What does that mean? So there were around a thousand plus employees in the factory next door, and they all came from nearby village or nearby town, I should say, and uh, the surrounding villages as well. And what we did was we agreed that we will not take any employees. So almost 30% of our employees were from that town. We agreed that we would not take any until that, that entire town was in lockdown and until that town has been completely tested. We agreed we would not uh, bring, bring any people to work from that side. So even with the 30% uh, impact to our workforce, uh, the reason it was acceptable just to us is we had enough of a workforce in the other geographies that we could still keep the site running and not miss a beat. Uh, we identified alternate routes for employees to come to work. So we basically, now we had to bypass this neighbor. So we had to find defined routes, which were a little bit circuitous, but we eventually found a way to get them to work while with, without impacting the red zone. Next. For a limited number of employees, have them stationed on site. Now, this is something, uh, again, we were able to do in some cases. Some of it was actually based on social restrictions. Uh, what happened was, uh, again, this happens, I think India, as you know, is a pretty big country and a lot of people come actually in our workforce come from, from, come from the villages. So for people coming from the villages, in addition to the government requirement and to the pressure from the family, even the village head would have a say in whether they come to work or not. So in some cases, the village head would say, okay, you can take these guys to work, but don't bring them back. So we had to provide them housing, but again, we had to make sure they are tested because we don't want them coming on site and infecting each other. So that's the other challenge we had. Next. And ultimately we want to be B and be perceived as a piece of place of work, which is to the same safety standards as home. So again, I, you know, we regularly audit, we go around take uh, auditing for social distancing, for masks and uh, making sure that people feel safe as safe. So the people who come to work, and I think that's where we have been successful in creating that perception, despite the situation which happened next door, that it can be done successfully. So the key was, if I go to the next uh, bullet, uh, having a consistent leadership message on safety and compliance. We have 25 industry guidelines from the government, uh, having them at the back of our mind and drilled into us walking the talk, going around on the floor, talking to the people, addressing their concerns, finding out why they don't feel as safe as at home and nonstop communication. Now it is a challenge and I'll talk a little bit about communication on the next few slides. So communication of the, all the measures via all available channels, monitors, internet, announcements, banner boards, we're doing all that, having a dedicated info point on the internet, telephone hotline, role model for hygiene, so all that was, uh, you know, again, uh, let's, let me continue to the next slide, please. Regular updates to customers, suppliers, and external partners. So the exemption we got, we then had to get on the phone with our suppliers. We called each supplier, we told them we have this exemption to produce ventilator parts. Now using that exemption, 
we want you to start your factory and start building parts for us. So that's the level of in involvement we have with our entire supply chain. And then doing push SMS to all employees. So I would say overall, we had a pretty good su successful communication strategy. But uh, again, in the situation we had in India, it was impossible because you had TV channels, news channels. Yesterday, there was a news article about us in the newspaper in the front page. So you can't compete with that kind of attention, attention and the communication we do. It was a positive article about us building ventilators. So there was no, no issue with the article. But when the communication around you is so overwhelming, uh, your communication can only hope to be a fraction of that. Uh, I'll give you another example of a communication challenge. When we were trying to ask an employee to come to work, his mom had heard on the news that there was this issue next door to us. So the employee immediately put his mom on the phone and asked us to talk to her on why her son should come to work. So those were some of the challenges you can imagine we, we ran into. And uh, I can say in hindsight, we, we addressed them successfully. So I think that's my last slide. Uh, I want to thank you for your time and giving me a listen. Thank you very much, Daniel. And uh, I have to say, uh, really bold actions there. So I'm sorry, <laughs> that is almost a blueprint for a, a continuity of business plan. And uh, I just want to say congratulations on you on taking that bold decision to do the testing and also to move to ventilators. And I'm sure I speak for everyone listening to this. Um, may I just ask a quick question though? Um, you mentioned earlier on almost a, a tiny point where you said many of the functions in a business can now be done virtually that we didn't think could be. And could you could just give me a couple of examples of things you've learned as almost a, a bonus of this of this consequence of this virus? I'll give an example. So I think one of our key technical functions in our factory, we also have a design center and design. Uh, we act as a design back office for European factories. So what we do is we also do computer-aided modeling, computer-aided design. Now, these, are, uh, these have very high requirements in terms of computer intensive. Uh, you need a very good bandwidth, very good internet speed. Yeah. And uh, within India, we didn't really feel it was feasible to do it from home. But we were faced with no choice for the less than a week we were shut down. We had to provide that service so that in addition to, we don't just, it's not just us, we don't affect our Austria site. So to do that, we actually uh, worked around it. We identified internet hotspots, we identified internet hardware, we upgraded their hardware. And we found that yes, it was difficult, but actually despite the slightly slower internet connection, their productivity was actually as good as what it was in the office. Okay. Now, you could draw two conclusions from it. Maybe in the office, they were gossiping a lot and not working as hard and uh, didn't have as many distractions. But really, the fact that the internet infrastructure was a bit of a hindrance, yeah. but it wasn't, uh, wasn't really an impact to output. They were able to produce as good as our output from their home office, which we never expected, frankly, than uh, what we saw when they were in the office. Does and, that and somebody's, help? Somebody's asked a question. Uh, yeah, that's a great answer. Someone asked a question. Was there an impact because of this lack of travel and lack of face-to-face on your supplier management, supplier visits, were you able still to manage and projects and suppliers virtually? Yeah, yeah, I think with the, so definitely we have, so in our case, because of the process being very intensive with the supplier collaboration on the chemical side, we have actually quite a few supplier station in our factory. So we are made arrangements for them to take advantage of the same exemptions that we did locally. And also we had video conferences with the supplier management, whether it was in India or Europe. So we were able to make sure that we actually spanned. I think the supplier, I, I think the learning, which I, what I heard from uh, the Intel presentation and, and also from the on is, I think with the technology we have today with Zoom and uh, all the tools we have today, supplier collaboration is not really so difficult using the same yeah. tools we are doing now. Yeah, I think we're all, all learning that. One very last quick question is, uh, someone's asked, how, how do you get access to so much testing equipment? Because I know in many parts of the world, uh, here in the UK, we are struggling to find testing equipment. So how do you, you mean, access that? You mean COVID testing? COVID-19 testing, yes. Sorry, yeah, yes. Yeah. So I think I, I, would, I would be lying. I think if I gave the impression that for us, it was easy access to COVID testing, that's not the case. We actually relied on the government's test um, kit availability to do the testing. Okay. But since the neighbor next door had uh, close to 900 people being tested because of that incident, by default, that became a priority for the state and almost for the country. So okay. the government had yeah. limited kits, but they were focusing because we had such a major blow up next door that yeah. the testing was happening by default and it was helping us decide also. So I think in the sense that I think testing is still a challenge, not enough test kits is a global problem and India is no exception. Okay. 
Yeah, I can see that. So, well, compliments to you again and, and lots you. of luck and stay safe. Thank you so much for your time today, Sunil. Thanks, Super. thanks again. Now, yep. before we go to the next speaker, um, if I may, <clears throat> I'd like to run a quick poll. We would like to ask you all to, um, there's a poll going to appear on the screen in a moment, um, to share your thoughts as to your interest, if you like, in attending um, one of these five events, a two-day online conference via webinar, a three-hour focus online session spread over four days, once again virtually. Would you consider a physical in-person conference during the summer of this year? Would you consider one from September to December? Or would you consider a virtual webinar similar to this one? Please could you tick all of those that you would be interested in going forward in the next 12 months? Actually, it won't allow you to click multiple. So just click the one that you think is, is the one you would definitely consider. Most interested, I guess, is if you would consider a face-to-face -face con physical conference later in the year. Okay, good. Now, um, next up is, Ron, are you going next or is it Mario? I believe I'm going next. Okay, Ron, good. Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Um, lovely to see you here today. And uh, you've got three excellent speakers to follow. So let me just introduce you. Um, you joined CNW in early 2013, and you spent 10 years before that with DHL. Um, you describe yourself, I believe, as being very customer focused and customer centric. And um, I'm sure like a lot of us, we've been working night and day to, to keep those customers running. Um, so if you could share your um, thoughts with us, Ron, that would be great. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I am uh, broadcasting actually from Tel Aviv. And this afternoon when I had to travel from home to the office, the roads were completely empty. And uh, I, do, I think I was the only car on, on the road. It was amazing, very amazing. And it's nice to see you all. Um, I believe many of you know CNW. We are uh, moving urgent and critical shipments all over the world for the last 34 years, 24-7. And we support heavily the semiconductor industry and the automotive industry, but mainly for many, many years, the semiconductor industry. Okay, uh, can you please move to the next uh, slide? So, as you all know, we are facing a different world, a new world, actually a closed world. We can see it on the next slide, um, where many countries uh, are closed, shut down. Uh, I mean, the main centers of the world, like Manhattan, Washington, uh, India, Malaysia, many of them are uh, in area where manufacturing a semiconductor in the Philippines, in Malaysia, when there were closures, and it makes, uh, makes it challenging to move in and out shipments. India, for example. Uh, next, please. So we are about 200 countries that are closed or affected. And of course, obviously, it affects also uh, the airports, and the uh, passengers. But uh, we are talking here today about the cargo traffic and transportation, and there is a huge effect on the moving, moving freight and moving cargo all over the world. <clears throat> Next, please. So we can see that the effect on the, uh, the aviation uh, and the impact on the aviation is dramatic. The coronavirus is grounding the world's airlines. The aviation industry may not fully recover from the effects of the pandemic. And next, please. And, and we can see that um, some of the major airlines are facing huge challenges. And I don't know if they ever come out of this uh, situation. This is the picture of the plane that we can see that some of the planes are moving now from passengers uh, to move cargo just to, to try and survive. And what will come next 
we, we don't really know, but uh, we believe that airlines will offer fewer choices in the higher fares and uh, it will be some, there will be some challenging times for the airlines moving forward. This is an uh, overview of uh, Europe uh, airplanes just uh, before the COVID-19 uh, started. And you can see the difference nowadays at the end, on the next slide, a, a picture from the end of uh, March. I think uh, April even looks uh, worse. And you can see, for example, Italy, <laughs> no flights over Italy, just for an example. And uh, it's about 90% reduction in these areas in the air transportation, which of course brings a huge challenge to move in and out cargo. This is the decline we can see on the main lanes and main countries. You can see in this slide that it gets at the end of March. And as I said, April is even worse because the development in, in the UK and in the US and Italy and Spain. So we can see that it's a dramatic and nearly 90, 95% of the flights are canceled and uh, less traffic. Here I brought you some figures so you can really understand the major airlines like Lufthansa that cuts up to 90% of their flights. Uh, in Europe, it would only operate 20% of the intra-European flights. They grounded all their Airbus A380 fleet. This is the biggest uh, airplanes with huge capacity. They're all grounded. They cancel 23,000 flights just in April. The Thai Pacific is reduced by 96% in April and May. Turkish Airlines temporarily suspended all international flights. Next, please. You can see on the right, the British Airways fleet sitting uh, on the ground. And this is a major thing, you know, it's the cost of it is, it's a huge, huge, really huge, and it will affect those companies for a long time. So British Airways cuts capacity up to 70%, 75%, sorry. American Airlines, 60 to 70% in April and 80 to 90% in May. Um, in Singapore Airlines, they canceled the uh, 3,000 flights just recently. So I can tell you that when I came here, I listened to the news and I heard that in the, in the US, two days ago, there were 100,000 passengers in all the airports in the US. In a normal day, there are 2 million passengers moving in all the airports of uh, the US. So it's a 95 percent decrease in the passengers. So you understand that it's also a 95 percent decrease or almost 95 percent decrease in the uh, aircraft and the possibility to move freight. And that's a very challenging situation. Next, please. So for us, when we had to move and I'm just giving you an example. Yes, you know, we are moving uh, mainly urgent and critical shipments. And we start to move, uh, we want to move uh, shipments from Germany, for example, or from Europe to Asia Pacific using Singapore Airlines or Lufthansa. Next, please. And here you have to be to say very quickly. So that's what we get. This option is not available anymore. This option is not av available anymore. And you have to be very creative and find a solution in many, in many cases in, in, a, in a minute or in a, it's the concept, the, the flight cancellation can be in, in, a, in a very short notice. So the cargo can be already on the plane and suddenly you, we are notified that the plane will not, take, will not take off. Then you have to find a solution, an alternative solution. So operation managers, which are working 24 seven, they need to be up to date. They need to be very flexible and they need to find a solution 
immediate, immediate solution to move our, our urgent shipments. This is a very challenging in, uh, during those days. I can tell you about a story of a shipment that we had to move from the US to a plant in Morocco. Uh, again, very urgent. And the first leg was US to France. And from France, we were supposed to continue. By the time the freight arrived to, to France, the, all, the can, all the flights to Morocco were canceled. So we had to drive all the way uh, to the ferry and then from, uh, uh, take the ferry and move the, the shipment until it got to the factory. So instead of moving it in a few hours, it took us a few days. And that's the challenges we, we, have, have, to, we have to face. But always find the solution to our customers. We will get you the shipment. Next, please. So you can understand that uh, these days, the um, cargo uh, aircraft are much more uh, interesting and, uh, than the passengers' flights. And um, some of the airlines are really trying to survive or to still operate by moving passenger um, aircraft to, um, to cargo aircraft. Next, please. Yes, so we see an increase in, in the number of airlines that are now piling cargo in the cabins of their aircraft in the hope to generate fraction of the revenue they would have generated under normal circumstances. American Airlines, for example, um, operated the first casual cargo only flight since 1984. So yes, a very small fraction of the uh, aircraft are moving from passengers uh, to uh, cargo, which is much more attractive these days, but still we have a huge capacity problem because though many of those aircrafts are full with medical supply, uh, with masks, and uh, especially coming from China. So we all know that the, you, there is a huge demand for those masks and the medical supply. And many of those aircraft that shift from passengers to cargo are now full with this medical supply. But we need, need, need still to move semiconductor, right? So these are some of the solutions, but there are more solutions. Uh, next, please. Yes, this is just to show you the, the demand for the masks and the medical supply, and, and it's really huge. We also got many requests from uh, different companies to support them. If it's a, if it's a company that is a, a customer of ours, a semiconductor company or automotive company, we would help them with, uh, we would do our best to move their uh, medic, uh, medical supply. But if it's just a, uh, someone who tries to make money out of it, we would not support this. Um, but it shows you really a huge, a huge uh, volume uh, of uh, medical. Next, please. So of course, when the, the supply is going uh, down and the demand is increasing, the prices are going high, uh, rocketing to the to the sky, and if uh, just to give you an example, if normal cargo, I'm not talking about the express that we are moving, but just normal cargo that used to cost one dollar, two dollars, three up to five dollars a kilo, is now costing between fifteen and twenty dollars a kilo just to move to find the capacity and move the freight. So you understand the the challenges and the impact on the supply chain and on the cost. It's tremendous. Next, please. One more effect on our business is that we cannot uh, offer any more uh, onboard couriers and hand carries. As you know, it's not just because uh, <clears throat> we use hand carries, not when it's uh, only when it's urgent, but also when some uh, shipments are really uh, high value, very important. It can be a prototype, it can be a, something that is fragile, it cannot be tilled. And suddenly this option is closed. It's closed because first of all, we protect our employees. Second, it's closed because uh, no, no flights. 
And third, because if you already reach to a country, you have to be, stay in quarantine for 14 days. So which onboard courier will take such a, a condition? So this is another challenge we had to face. Yes, please, next. So one way to overcome it is the, the charter planes that we utilize and uh, many other uh, companies are operating uh, charter flights. And I think the charter companies are booming at the moment. So we can see companies like uh, Atlas Worldwide that arrange uh, several uh, charters uh, to destination in the US to support the US uh, president's uh, coronavirus task force or United Cargo that is supporting the military services. Even uh, Virgin Atlantic operated its first uh, cargo only charter. Um, so these are really interesting days when it comes to the charter. We also, that we normally, our main uh, solutions are uh, NFO, next flight out, hand carries and charters. We move uh, many more to charter operating. Uh, next, please, I can show you some of the lanes we are moving. Um, so we actually, at the first uh, phase, we started to use Singapore as a, as a hub, and we had the flights on the uh, Chengdu to Singapore, Singapore to Penang, Singapore to Saigon, um, Portland to San Francisco, uh, Dalian to Hong Kong, and we will start uh, these days, we are starting the San Francisco to Chengdu uh, charter. And this gives us a, a good, uh, good uh, answer to the lack of uh, air at the moment, air flights at the moment. And um, we all the time monitoring uh, the situation day by day and see what our customers are, what our customers uh, needs and we build the solution right for them. Next please. So uh, one of the major industry for semiconductor is the automotive, uh, which we also support, but uh, the automotive industry was uh, highly affected from the coronavirus. 95% of the UK and U uh, Europe plants uh, were shuttered. Uh, also in North America, this is the case at the moment, and uh, the impact is, 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 is huge. So also the demand for semiconductor in those areas is, is slowing down, is reducing. Um, yes, so plants are closing, and we are notified every day. Nowadays, I think most of them are already closed, but we can see that in China, they are getting back to business, and we are also notified that some factories in Austria and other uh, countries are planning to open at the beginning of May, end of April, beginning of May. So it's in a three weeks time, hopefully some of this will start uh, reopening again. But of course it has an impact on the transportation and, uh, and on the demand of uh, semiconductor. At the same time, we see an increase on the next slide that the, the semiconductor are essential components in uh, many, in, Actually, all the uh, all, uh, things in our life, uh, from medical devices or water system or communication, energy, transportation, health, healthcare, and even the financial system. So it's all over. Um, yes, so as we all know, we are working uh, mostly from home now. So the increase, the, there is an increase in demand for laptops and computers. And this situation actually creates also big demands from all kinds of uh, direction we could not uh, foresee before. For example, I know that the China, the Chinese government asks a um, few big companies to, to support them to create the ability to and educate their kids from home. So to support this, you need to have a huge network and communication support. And this, of course, creates a huge demand for 
the semiconductor for the chips. We also see it in the, in the medical supply. So semiconductor and the related supply chains will be necessary to support the greater range of services that will be utilized in the, in the coming weeks. We know that the, the semiconductor industry, the SIA association has been uh, take, asking Trump to be defined as the key industry and keep operating. Next, please. We in the CNW, we are like always hands on 24 seven. If we see something, uh, if a flight is canceled and we need to move to a different flight or even to a different airline at the moment, that's what we are doing. We are hands on monitoring very closely all our shipments and all the solution that in, are currently in the market. If there is a solution to move the shipment, we will know of, of it. And we will take this action to make sure the supply chain of our customers keeps on going. And we always look for the fastest uh, solution 24 seven. We have the experience of uh, 34 years in this industry. As I mentioned, hand carry is not the uh, option at the moment. It's not a real option at the moment, but um, NFO is still an option. Charter is an option, and we are moving a lot of freight for our customers and trying as much as possible to respect the prices we have agreed before, not increasing prices. And uh, we are really trying, even though it's uh, challenging. Next, please. So we're trying to be optimistic. Uh, as I said, I'm broadcasting, broadcasting from uh, Tel Aviv at the moment. And uh, soon, I believe that um, the government here will start, will try to get back to business slowly but surely in a week time. We already uh, start talking about it. And I hope we will be uh, one of the first one and then all the other countries will join and soon we'll be back to normal business thank you very much okay ron thank you very much indeed and i believe israel was one of the first countries in the world to uh start closing down business so um really bold changes there in the world my word things that can take years have taken weeks so we had a question from mike rosser and he says how does charter price per kilogram compare to commercial flights so it depends. It depends because there is no way the chart, when you say charter flights, the aircraft can be a small aircraft yeah. or a big aircraft, and it can be a short line or a long line. So and it, and also it depends on how much freight you put in. So if you fill it out completely, and it's a small aircraft, sometimes it can be that the price will be lower. But if it's a bigger aircraft and it's a, uh, it's a long line and you don't feel it completely, then the price can be even higher than the normal cargo. So it depends a lot right. on the situation. So very complicated world. I love the pictures of all those planes with no seats in. Uh, <laughs> extraordinary, extraordinary. Ron, thank you so much. Thank so, you. Um, um, our next speaker is uh, Mr. Thomas Stokes, who um, is the Senior Managing Director of um, Evercore and uh, has a background in an extremely impressive organization, Goldman Sachs, where he was head of electronics and industrial technology investment banking, uh, where he spent over 13 years in that role. Uh, today, he advises, advises companies or his organization does all over the world. So Tom, please, could you share your insights uh, on this really important topic today? Thank you for coming today. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Um, uh, it said it's uh, Tom Stokes. I'm joined by colleagues Preston Comey and Kunal Chakrabarty as well. Uh, and uh, uh, we're in the Technology Investment Banking Group at Evercore. Um, let's go to page two, can we? So uh, we'll be sharing perspectives on how COVID-19 uh, and the issues around COVID-19 are affecting the global markets, the semiconductor backdrop, and also M&A activity. Uh, and um, obviously the pandemic coupled with 
the oil price shock has had a really major impact on stock indices around the world. And you can see that on the top left of this chart. We track and investors track very closely something called the volatility index, the VIX. Uh, that VIX uh, is really in the, is currently in the, in the mid 40s, uh, having spiked the mid 60s uh, at the beginning of the pandemic crisis. And, and just to give you context, it hit uh, 80 back in the 2008 depression. And in calmer times, it's in the 10 to 20 range. So uh, you know, in, the, in the mid 40s, it's certainly elevated. And that gives you a sense of uh, investor um, mindset and investor concern here. Um, more recently, we've had this little mini rally over the last couple of weeks. And you know, the question is, is that going to be a temporary phenomenon? And we, is it just a false hope? And we're going to see new lows. I think people will be very focused on uh, Q1 results. Uh, it's going to be difficult to assess Q1 results because companies are typically not going to give guidance because it's very, very hard to predict you know, what's going to happen over the next several weeks. And, and so most companies are removing guidance for Q2 and also for the full year. Um, if you look at the bottom of this chart, we have uh, GDP growth estimates. And again, this is really difficult to predict. Uh, and you know, the Different analysts across Wall Street have uh, you know, w widely diverging estimates for what um, uh, GDP looks like. At Evercore, you know, our current estimate, uh, you know, and this changes weekly, to be honest, our current estimate is down, has US GDP down 50%, now negative 5-0% in Q2, uh, with expectations for negative 16% for the year. Uh, you know, we're calling it really a fish hook shape. It goes from zero to negative 50 to negative five and then plus five by Q4. But again, you know, this data is changing uh, on a weekly basis. You know, the, the results out of China, I think, are positive. You look at the bottom right here, uh, negative 20% for one quarter and then a bounce back, a quick bounce back to plus four and then plus six, plus six. Uh, and, and so, and we're hearing, you know, pretty positive reports from our global clients with operations in China. Let's go to the next slide. So at Evercore, uh, we, uh, uh, our research team conducts a regular, we call it a flash survey of investors. And this is really helpful data to give a week by week snapshot of investor sentiment. And as you can see, investors are expecting US unemployment at this point to peak above 15%. Uh, and expect the coronavirus to peak in May. And in the bottom right, you can see some data around when folks expect the China supply chain to be back to near normal in the, in the May or June time is the, is the most popular answer. But uh, you know, the companies we speak to typically are a little bit more bullish on that, notwithstanding challenges in some of the geographies around the world, like Malaysia. Um, what do investors need to see an overall shift in sentiment? Well, I think they're carefully watching the number of cases and looking for some stabilization or a peak. They're also looking for a pharma solution and that uh, and, and really tracking where those pharma solutions sit. And that's either you know, treatments of which there are several uh, that folks are working on or longer term, medium to long term on the vaccine front. And again, people, are, investors are, uh, are studying the companies that are at the heart of, of trying to solve those uh, those issues. Let's turn to page four uh, and we'll look at the semiconductor industry in a little bit more detail. And you can see, you know, the stock prices on a year-to-date basis are down a very similar level to the overall market. Year-to-date performance is down 25%. And I think I agree with a lot of the sentiment that was shared earlier in the in the, in the webinar, folks saying, look, you know, semiconductor is absolutely critical. Uh, many of the markets that the semi industry uh, serve are actually doing really well through this crisis, uh, which we'll talk about in a second. But um, year to date performance down 25%. And growth rates on the bottom uh, right of this chart, you know, we were looking at a semi uh, device uh, growth rate of 11% in 2020. Uh, now we're looking at a flat to slight decline in the year. Wafer fabrication equipment is a little bit more positive. Yeah, we were looking at 15% coming into the year, but now still a healthy 7% growth. And that part in part explains why you look on the left, the semi front end equipment have actually declined less than uh, the S&P and uh, doing, doing relatively well from a 
stock price perspective. Um, let's, uh, let's turn to page five and dig in in a little bit more detail on a semi-industry. Uh, look, from a near-term demand picture, the reality is it's very hard to quantify with precision what demand looks like. But uh, the good news for the semi-industry is we, we, we already had a decline in 2019 uh, which meant that inventory levels were a little healthier going into this crisis than perhaps you know was the case in 2008. And the, the situation was quite different then, and so the comparables we're comparing with um, in 2019 are, are, are less challenging, and that dampens the impact of this downturn on the market broadly in the semi space. And you know, if you look at semi revenues x memory on the bottom left there, you can see. Uh, the Evercore is is looking at um, you know 305 billion in semi revenues ex memory, uh, which is really flat relative to 2019, and that's the bear case with a slightly more bullish case of 318 billion revenues uh, 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 in, in this what we're calling the base case. And you know the real picture though is quite different by end market, and you know our conversations with the C suites of semiconductor companies and and the end market customers of semis. Uh, really are startlingly different. Um, everything from, you know, the server demand we're seeing right now is absolutely exceptional. And obviously that's due to uh, the cloud capacity ramp to support all our uh, video conferencing demands uh, and all our work from home demands. Um, uh, and so that's obviously on the positive side. Comtech, uh, similarly uh, positive story when we talk to the CEOs of uh, the big service providers. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, automotive, you know, huge list, huge dislocations in the automotive market, at least in the US, and you know, plant shutdowns and consumer end demand issues being really at the heart of that. Uh, you know, on, on the other hand, and I know many folks on our uh, semi equipment makers and. Uh, um, you know, the biggest concern we think in the semiconductor equipment space is the supply chain constraints for certain key parts and certainly out of Malaysia. Uh, but the expectation still is growth in semi-equipment spending, 53 billion. We came into the year with 57. We're now at 53. So still a pretty positive story on semi-equipment. And the reality is folks haven't seemed to slow down their spending on technology, uh, at least for now. Let's 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 go to the next slide, please. And you've got here just some commentary around what industry participants are saying. I know in the spirit of moving this along, I'll skip this and you can read this at your convenience later. Um, let's look at the M&A environment on page seven. Um, obviously, M&A uh, has been substantially impacted by COVID-19. The US market down 50% year to date globally down 25%. The reality is um, in a market like this, sellers don't want to sell at discounted prices and buyers can't really diligence what they're buying right now. It's really hard to know with precision what the revenue and EBITDA of a target company is gonna be three, six, nine months from now. And so it's very hard to know what you're buying. And also buyers are tending to focus on their own liquidity, their own balance sheets. They're canceling share buybacks, in some instances, they're even cancelling dividends to, per, to really preserve liquidity. Now, there are situations that are still going on. Uh, you yeah, know, there are some large cap acquirers who are looking at this and saying, OK, maybe we can help some of the smaller companies out that have uh, some challenging balance sheet conditions. You know, maybe there's a investment we can make. Maybe we can buy a division from one of those companies that will shore up their balance sheet. And, and, and you yeah, know, that will be a good, good opportunity for us as well. Also, technology buys are also um, uh, you know, still getting done. Uh, so that's really the, the, you know, what, what's going on in the M&A market. And we've got a little bit more on the semi space on the next page. And again, uh, I'll just, just briefly, you, you could briefly see that a you know, huge uptick in semi M&A. We were expecting a, uh, a, a big uptick again in 2020. I can't see that happening now, just given the current situation. But um, uh, Let's go again to the last page, uh, page nine, and I'll leave you with this. You know, eight trends to watch uh, in a post-COVID world. 
you know, I think there's going to be an enormous amount of debate uh, from industry participants, from Wall Street observers and from investors in, ter in terms of how the world changes post COVID. And, you know, certainly the question that is um, being debated already is, you know, will the global supply chain be reoriented uh, post this situation? Will we move to a much more local supply chain? I do think people have short memories in the grand scheme of things. And so um, uh, I think economics wins out uh, ultimately, uh, but certainly the, there'll be a debate about global supply chains becoming more local. And then as this webinar has so uh, ably uh, demonstrated, you know, the ability to work remotely uh, is certainly feasible. And I think that this whole uh, shift to uh, uh, remote working, it obviously also accelerates the need for public cloud. And so some of the companies that are public cloud oriented will also benefit. 5G, you know, delayed in 2020, but long term, the adoption of 5G is intact. So with that, I uh, wanted to keep this uh, to 10. Uh, um, let me see if there's any questions, but that concludes remarks. Again, thank you, Salah, for inviting us to uh, present today. Tom, uh, thank you so much. Fantastic. And so much data there. Amazing. Um, who would have thought we'd see graphs like that in, in, uh, in our lifetime? Extraordinary. So can I ask, please, who has a question uh, for an undoubted expert in this area for Tom, please? One, one question. Is, the questions are flying through here, Tom. Um, oh, do you see, uh, I, this might mean something to you, Tom. Do you see a V-shape or a U-shape when this is over? Well, you know, that, that's a great <laughs> debate, right? So uh, we're talking about the shape of the recovery, uh, recovery. V-shape, U-shape, L-shape, or something else. Uh, and uh, as I said before, we actually have this thing called the fishhook shape, uh, which is the G GDP growth in the U.S., Again, you know, zero for Q1, negative 50 Q2, uh, negative five Q3, negative, uh, and then positive five for Q, Q4. But what I would caution, and look, look at the China data that I presented, that's, that's a helpful uh, indication for what could happen elsewhere. Yeah. I think the biggest question on people's minds, honestly, is has this done real permanent damage to the demand picture? And that's yeah. our biggest issue with respect to recovery. Yeah, no, I think you're right. And that's across all markets. Um, any more questions for Tom, please? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, please. Okay. So uh, with this, uh, China factories, uh, news is coming out is mostly uh, working at capacity. Uh, at the same time, uh, there is in, because of the situation, the inventory, the, the semiconductor inventory has also got depleted now. So we are anticipating a faster recovery for semiconductor products. So how do you see that? Yeah. Hi, Ron. Great talk earlier today. Oh, uh, someone might want to go on mute there. Um, got a good amount of background noise. There you go. Yeah. Uh, so you're saying, sorry, you're saying, um, uh, 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 could you just repeat that again? Because I, I got lost with the, with the background. So the, the question is, uh, the you know, China is back. Um, online now, uh, and then factories yes. are, are running at capacity. And they, at the same time, they also have depleted most of the semiconductor devices. Uh, sure. So we are anticipating a faster recovery, uh, keeping in mind that if we can control this uh, COVID-19 uh, situation. How yes. do you see that? Yeah. yeah, so uh, it's a great question. And I think that's a big concern from everyone in the industry. You know, uh, we're in the C-suites of the largest semiconductor companies. and. The, the first thing they say in some instances, again, market by market, um, very specific, but for the rosier markets, let's say servers and let's say um, cloud infrastructure, say, look, we could be on for really staggering results in, uh, in uh, May, June, but the biggest challenge is can we ship? And I think uh, the same thing is true for semiconductor equipment companies we're, we're talking to. You know, um, significant positive results coming in June but can we ship? And uh, uh, what we're hearing is with the geographies that are absolutely shut down right now, uh, where there's a critical component and maybe it's single sourced um, to one geography, that's become, gonna become a real issue. And, um, and so while China's back to work, if a key component from it, it buried in the supply chain is coming from one of these shut down uh, uh, geographies, I think it's gonna be very hard for people to ship their products. 
And so I wouldn't expect a quick snapback. I'd expect some of these things to be, even though the demand might be there uh, in certain markets, I, I'd expect the supply chain issue to be a, a limiting factor. So good question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Tom. All right, um, I would love to chat more, but we need to pause there. Thanks, Tom. Um, just thank you quick, very much. Uh, thank you, Tom. A quick reminder, after this session, which we're extending slightly, will be uh, a networking opportunity using the breakout function we have here in Zoom, and you'll be able to network and discuss the issues raised by this conference with your, your colleagues and peers in, in two sessions of 10 minutes. So if you can uh, stay around for that, um, I'm going to put the link on the private chat now. So you might want to just save this to your browser. Um, there's a, a number you can add to, and also a link. So you can see that there. So the next speaker we have is Mario Morales. Uh, he's um, the program vice president of IDC, enabling technologies and storage and data sphere research. Um, very much an analyst by heart, I think, and, and has got his finger on the pulse when it comes to emerging markets and trends, forecasting, and research. Now, if there's ever been a need for forecasting and uh, spotting trends, I'd imagine it's now. Um, lots of experience in the industry with 25 years building multinational top tier consulting sales and research teams. So Mario, we're looking forward to hearing your views on, on this subject and see if we can uh, learn some wisdom from you, sir. So over to you, please. Yeah, thank you very much for, for letting me participate in this, in this webinar. Um, please, if you can go to the next slide. Since we have a limited amount of time, I wanted to really start first by setting the context. If, if we go back to 2019, 2019 was a down year for the semiconductor market. A lot of it had to do with uh, inventory issues throughout the year. Um, and most markets really declined with some exceptions like the PC market and, and other parts, so in, including cloud later in the year. But as we think about COVID-19 and, and start looking at it from a semiconductor perspective, I, we're definitely seeing an impact that first began from a supply chain standpoint. But as we look further into the year, um, definitely it's the pendulum is swinging more towards a demand related issue. I, I will share the scenarios that we have put together over the last couple of months. We've been updating our numbers every, every two weeks based on uh, inputs that we're receiving. So I'll talk a little bit also about IDC's outlook for ICT spending, as well as what our perspective is in terms of the GDP numbers. I think when you look at GDP and you look at ICT spending, the, the growth rates tend to mirror each other. And, and also whether they grow or decline tend to be very consistent given the maturity of some of these markets and the size of some of these markets. I'll leave you with some of the key takeaways that we see because I think there are pockets of areas within the semiconductor space that will continue to grow. Uh, especially over the coming quarters. And then there are others that uh, are definitely more concerning like automotive and industrial and a lot of the consumers facing markets just because not only are we seeing a lot of dislocation in, in, in across different regions in terms of employment, but there's also a, a changing in consumer behavior. And that is still something that we're doing a lot more work in, but I think it's also very important to point out because it, it could impact how we're thinking about a recovery later in the year. So as we look at the scenarios, um, right now we're really gearing towards this uh, scenario one, very consistent with what Tom was talking about. We're expecting about a 12% decline rate uh, for this year. Uh, even though we're, our, our anticipation was that the technology supply chain will recover within the next one to three months, we do still see a global disruption to, to the economies around the world. And, and that will, of course, impact some technology demand. And so that will elongate a recovery between nine to 12 months. And then in some cases, there's a broader impact on technology where some of the technologies that we were expecting to really take hold, like 5G, uh, IoT, AR, VR, you start looking at AK televisions because of the Olympics. Now that the Olympics are not happening in uh, this year, some of these technologies will not really become prime time until we get into 2021. So I wanted to share what our current scenario sentiment is. This is based on a lot of the work that we do. And it does take into account not only supply chain related issues that I think are very important for, for semiconductor companies, but also the, the demand side of the equation, which I think is becoming a lot more concerning as we move forward into the year. The next slide, please. So as we look at this and we apply the scenario one, uh, to give you some context, um, before this, uh, this, this COVID-19, 
we were really getting back to the bottom of the, the downturn that we saw in 2019. So we were expecting a gradual recovery in 2020. It wasn't going to be a very robust recovery because I think that before COVID-19, China was already weak and, and China drives uh, not only one third of the semiconductor market, but it drives the largest markets, whether it's automotive, PCs and tablets, or even smartphones. These are very critical markets that drive the consumption of silicon. So as we look at this scenario now, you're looking at a market now that's going to shed about 50 billion from the previous outlook in, in early January of this year. So you're looking at a market that is about 370 billion in size and will gradually recover as we move forward uh, in time. And I think as, as some of the other colleagues that have spoken today, they've talked a lot about the fact that semiconductor technology is extremely essential and it plays a role in how it affects other market segments. Um, and so I still fundamentally believe that. I think regardless of what's going on uh, from a demand standpoint, one thing is still very clear. There was still a lot of design activity for semiconductors and the semiconductor content growth was still intact. And I think as the markets begin to gradually recover, I think the enterprise sectors, cloud services, broadband areas, these are markets that the, where the content is still growing and you're gonna see some of those markets perform better than some of the consumer facing ones. But overall, this slide is showing you a slower recovery. It's more of a U-shaped type of recovery as opposed to a V-shaped recovery that we've seen in the past with other outbreaks like um, Zika and, and even the initial SARS in early 2002. They're just different dynamics that are coming into play here. And in, in previous outbreaks, what, what we didn't see was a global pandemic like we're seeing today. But I think what is, again, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in the next slide, please. So the, um, one of the things that, and I won't spend a lot of time on this because others have covered this, but ODMs and semiconductor suppliers are really getting their workers back in now. And we're starting to see that the manufacturing is returning back to normal. We expect that over the next month, the, the chip companies themselves have already been back to normal, even though initially their throughput was a lot lower. They are now back to normal today. But some of the, the ODMs and system companies are taking a bit longer just because the, not only the utilization rates are lower, but they've had some trouble re, re, um, retraining their, their workers and ha actually getting some of their workers to come back in. And they've been offering, of course, incentives to do that. The government's been offering incentives. Uh, logistics and supply chain operations in China they're getting back to normal as well this month. And I think when you look at this from a supply chain standpoint, I think it's consistent with the scenario that we painted of, of a recovery of the supply chain over the next one to three months. Uh, some of our colleagues talked about earlier that there was some inventory uh, that people were leveraging and some of that is being depleted now. Uh, but I think a lot of the, the, the inventory and supply chain issues that we've seen relate more to areas like LCDs and monitors and sort of lower value chain components as opposed to what we're talking about now with memory and ASICs and, and, and processors. So overall, we're expecting supply chain to recover more in the three to six month range. But what is more concerning for me is, is we're, and what we're looking at more closely is whether or not suppliers are getting push outs by their customers. Because as you know, uh, the consumer is definitely becoming, the sentiment is, has changed very quickly around the world. And so they're not buying the things that we were used to seeing them buy and they're shifting their priorities of what they're buying and that will have a ripple effect in terms of the actual demand that the, then these suppliers could see. Next slide please. So if you look at ICT spending and GDP you can sort of see the contraction that we're expecting in 2020 and it, it even though it looks more like a v-shape uh, the contractions are still very strong. Uh, we're expecting that overall on a worldwide basis GDP will be down about 2%. And we're gonna see some major declines in Q1 and Q2. I think the worst is still yet to come in Q2. I think this is where you're gonna see what's really going on. I think Q1, most of the suppliers were able to take advantage of some of the extra uh, materials and, and, and inventory that they had. But as we look at Q2, I think it becomes more of a demand related issue and whether or not some of these companies are gonna be able to to, to meet the back to school requirements or whether or not they're even getting demand from their own supply chains and, and channels. And so this is gonna be important to see. I do believe that there's a recovery that will happen. I think it'll snap back, but it'll be gradual as we get closer to the end of 2020 and going into 2021. I think that the, that the US reacted very quickly 
in terms of the stimulus package that they have. Now, one third of the stimulus is really going to help the cash flow position of, of many institutions and enterprise. And the majority is going to give a one-time payment to, to a lot of the population. But what we're seeing now is a lot of the consumers are going to be probably more reluctant to spend that money given the amount of uncertainty that they're seeing in the coming quarters. And so because of that, I think the demand-related picture becomes a lot more uncertain and, and will take a little bit longer for recovery. Next slide, please. So as we look at IT spending, I think that the spending on devices is definitely going to show some major declines. Uh, one of the things that we saw last year was a, a replacement cycle for the PC market, especially around the enterprise. Even though tablets and phones and, and some of the peripherals were very weak last year, and we were ex anticipating these markets to recover this year because of 5G, we're, we're expecting some of those things to now be delayed. Um, and we think that even the 5G build out that we were expecting to see in terms of the, the amount of systems that we're going to ship will be, uh, that upgrade cycle will be delayed as consumers really start changing their buying be behavior and really prioritize, you know, medical equipment and being able to buy uh, needed goods and groceries as opposed to buying electronic gadgets over time. We think that overall infrastructure spending will still continue to grow. That's been one of the surprises that we've seen in the market where we're seeing um, a, a restocking by a lot of the cloud supplier, suppliers, suppliers, especially in the US, but we've also seen the same kind of reaction in, in China as well, where the infrastructure as a service and server provider spending on hardware will continue at least well into the third quarter. Beyond that, I think it becomes more uncertain, but I think that as we continue to shift to the cloud, um, that's going to drive a lot of the proportion of IT spending that we expect to see. I think if you're, if you're selling software services or, or, or spending on software, we're going to start seeing because of consumer confidence, we are starting to see some of the projects begin to be delayed or slowing down. And, and that's where I see more concerning efforts where IT services are expected to decline, especially around project oriented services or or, or companies beginning to postpone projects, especially some of the experimental projects that they're implementing uh, in their overall budgets. I think there's less impact on telecom spending. Again, some of that is because it's, it's infrastructure and many of those decisions are very long-term decisions. So we expect to continue to see very strong demand for broadband services in order to continue to support working uh, remotely and also in order to continue to use the cloud services and the gaming services that we're all now using while at home. Next slide, please. So these are some of just the numbers that you see across some of the board and as we've been sort of tracking this on a monthly basis. Clearly the sentiment is definitely continuing to decline. I think that Q2 and part of Q3 will probably be the, the sort of the worst case uh, scenario. So we still have to go through that still, but you can sort of see the, the different spending patterns from mobile phones to IT services and software. Um, next slide, please. If you look at it from a technology standpoint, uh, we definitely are beginning, we're, we're seeing these declines with some of the steeper declines on a revenue basis being in areas like PCs and tablets. And even though early in, in February, I'm sorry, in late February and early March, we saw people going to places to buy PCs and, and, and monitors to work from home. We're now beginning to see some of that level off. And we think that we were anticipating because of the strong replacement cycle that we saw last year, that we're going to see a more subdued second half of the year. And I think that that's consistent with the spending patterns that we're still seeing overall for IT. But this is, again, a quick snapshot. If you look at 2021, we are expecting recovery in certain sectors. Um, I think that the services area and the software areas, especially software, will still continue to see growth of, of just over 1% this year, despite a lot of the uncertainty. But we do see some of these markets begin to snap back as we go into 2021. Next slide, please. This is how we're seeing it from a device sales standpoint. Uh, we, there are certain countries that we track on a monthly basis, like China and India and Brazil. And we've definitely seen some very steep declines in terms of hardware consumption, whether it's PCs and tablets. The numbers are coming out of China for January and February, even, even after the, the Lunar New Year, were very, very low. And, and they're still declining as we go into March. And so you can sort of see that in these numbers and you can see that for smartphones, we're expecting about 6.2% decline rate on a unit volume basis for this year. And I think that number is still a bit uh, uh, 
uh, conservative might go down a little bit more than that, given that we're expecting to see some delays in, in the upgrade cycle for 5G. Um, if you look at PCs, even though we saw a nice uptick in March, I think that in the second half of the year, you're going to see more of a decline rate in those markets of over 10%. And then we still uh, we see a gradual recovery as we get back into 2021 with, with areas like smartphones recovering faster as we begin to see really a, a real strong stronger round for 5G next year. Next slide, please. So this is our forecast scenario as you look at it from a semiconductor perspective. I think like if you look at this space, we're, we're expecting that the overall decline rate for the semiconductor market would be about 12%. Uh, I think there are going to be some areas that are going to be hit much stronger than others. I think areas like automotive, uh, we're going to see some very strong declines in the, just the production of vehicles this year. But one of the positives of this, or the silver lining around here, is, is that, that the semiconductor content in automobiles is still growing very nicely. If you look at just over the last couple of years, the average car was, was consuming about $350 worth of silicon. By the end of our forecast period, we're still seeing over $700 worth of silicon uh, growth within vehicles. And so even though you might have lower production of vehicles, you can still see some mitigation because of the semiconductor content growth in that space. But we are anticipating a, a double digit kind of decline rate in automotive. Same in computing, especially uh, peripheral areas, areas like PCs and tablets. In the consumer facing areas as well, I think there's some bright spots um, in the smart home area, but in general, the consumers are not going to be spending a lot of money on, on consumer devices this year. You look at the industrial segments, because of a lot of the shutdowns and the disruption in shutdowns that we're seeing across industrial industries in the first half of the year, that will have an impact on the ability for these industries to recover as we look into the second half of the year. Overall, we do expect a pretty healthy snapshot as a snapback in 2021, uh, where we're anticipating, again, closer to 9% growth as we look for 2021 and seeing a recovery for the overall semiconductor market because we still believe that this industry is very essential and it does not only see the impact first, but also begins to see the recovery as uh, first before some of the other industries do. Next slide, please. So what are my key takeaways? I think uh, we heard it this morning when we heard uh, Jackie and, and Farhit uh, and a few others talk about this, but I think right now is, is, is a really important area because we're seeing a lot of challenges and uncertainty, but it also brings opportunity. And I think there are areas where you're gonna see some long-term investments um, that will continue to see areas like cloud services, um, uh, hardware uh, for medical equipment, uh, machine learning software, some of these areas of investment will continue. Long-term infrastructure projects will continue in areas like, again, healthcare and, and smart manufacturing. And I think that will remain intact. I think it's an important time also for leadership. We need to focus on our people right now and also be able to communicate very clearly with our employees. I think that's very essential, uh, being able to communicate very clearly with our supply chain and our partners. I think that is something that will really differentiate uh, the winners and the losers within this current crisis that we see. I think the semiconductor supply chain is on track to be back to normal over the next uh, month or two, I think especially in China and Asia, and will likely take a little bit longer for the system manufacturers, but what is I want to be, be very clear that, that um, I'm sorry, there's some background noise. I, I, I want to be very clear that what we need to continue to monitor is really the push out of orders from a demand standpoint, because I think that's the big unknown. And right now, this is where our focus is in terms of our research is, is as this virus has continued to spread around the world and, and affecting the macro factors, how is consumer spending going to react? How are the financial markets are going to react? I mean, everyone's looking at their 401k right now, and, it's, and that's definitely changing our sentiment. And also, how will employment continue to, to dislocate? Now, I think the smartest companies are the ones that are making guarantees that they're not going to make disruptions to their employment base or their supply chain. And I think that's very critical to really bring some level of leadership and confidence back into the industry. I think that China and the U.S., will continue to try to uh, create packages to stimulate the, the economies, but I don't ex see that accelerating until, until 2021. I think that for this year, there's just too much uncertainty, but I think that the stimulus 
will help recovery in 2021, especially around infrastructure and probably essential verticals like healthcare and industrial sectors where, where you're seeing some essential services emerge from those spaces. And so we're still very committed to our scenario one for this 2020. Uh, next slide, please. And, and more as a longer term view, as I think about, as we, as we prepare for recovery in 2021, there are specific areas that I think it's, are important for the semiconductor market to continue to focus on. I think cloud and communication service providers, they're still maintaining a very good and healthy cadence of investment. And I think semiconductor companies will take advantage of it because it's driving not only more performance, more demand for security and reliable technologies, and of course, hardware and services, but I also think that one of the biggest things that we started seeing over the last couple of years is this, this, this more, more computing being distributed. And as you start seeing that, you're going to see a lot more intelligence move to the edge and endpoints. And that's going to drive a lot more demand for lower latency technologies. And, and of course, it's going to continue to drive more capacity demand and, and demand for services. And I think there's an opportunity for more processing uh, silicon more power optimized solutions with high demand for endpoints. And I think you're gonna see a lot more investment in some of these uh, center areas, especially around the edge. I think there's some, what's gonna emerge from this crisis is gonna, also gonna see a lot of technologies that are gonna become more essential. I think low latency 5G connectivity for, com for connected infrastructure will be very important. Extremely low power biometric wearable technologies that can be used to prioritize uh, tele telehealth and, and remote healthcare. I think that's going to start seeing a lot more investment in these areas. And then being able to leverage some of the continuity that you heard this morning from Jackie and others, where you're using what you've learned in your manufacturing and applying it to other industries, other vertical industries. I think there's a lot of learning to be had that I think people are going to take advantage of. And also being flexible in how you build your systems, making sure that now you can build healthcare systems that are more flexible, that can scale as the need requires it. And we're seeing a lot of interest from governments and also companies where they're driving a lot more high performance computing to really drive more real time insights and machine learning and decision making using large pools of data. And this is what we've learned from the success stories in, in, in Taiwan or Korea or Singapore is that they're using large bodies of information to make actionable decisions and to help mitigate what we're seeing today in terms of the crisis. I think other nations have been slower to react, but there is information available. There is, the more informed these countries are, I think the better they can fight the, the, the current virus that they're seeing and then get back to more of what the new normal will be. I think in areas like memory and storage, even though the memory market has been hit hard over the past year or so, uh, we are seeing a recovery, at least in terms of the bits that are shipping, we're not seeing a recovery in ASPs uh, anytime soon, but we are seeing that the more cloud spending that you see, the more demand and appetite that you're seeing for memory, for SSDs, and overall for set storage because the, the appetite for data will continue. So the last slide, please. So I just want to conclude. I think that it's an interesting time for all of us. I think this is a time up right now for leadership. And, and I think the semiconductor industry as a whole is very, uh, very poised to be one of those leaders. I think that we're seeing that some of the technologies that we build and we enable are clearly essential. And I think that those are the areas where we must double down and, and continue to invest in order to see the benefits once these industries begin to recover. So with that, I want to conclude my talk. You have my email and my LinkedIn if you have any specific questions. And I, I can see some of the questions now. I'll turn it back over uh, to our moderator to, to see if they can manage the questions. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, Maria, uh, thank you very much indeed. Really interesting. And I think we could do a whole session on, on your talk there. Um, I think one of the questions has been answered. Will consumer market be the slowest to recover? Um, I'm guessing that's your view. It will be. Yes, it will be. I think that clearly we're still just seeing the start of it. I mean, we're, we're, we're seeing China now get back to normal from a supply chain, yeah. supply chain standpoint, but we have yet to see how the consumer is going to react and whether or not the stimulus that China is implementing now will help the consumers return. I think there's a certain amount of confidence. We do believe that China will definitely moderate better. Um, yeah. They've already began to recover, but it's gonna, it's gonna, it's a wait and see for the consumer. But we do believe the consumer will take longer to recover. 
yeah yeah i think that's the sentiment in uh us europe too as well so um can i ask the rest of you with those questions to contact mario via his linkedin or indeed email um, because we need to kind of move on i appreciate that i didn't want to shorten any of these topics okay. any speakers tom did you have a point there no heard a noise um what we're going to do now i'm going to send you this link again uh, we're going to work on the breakout version within Zoom, which you need to log into separately. Um, we're going to put you into small groups. You'll be able to network with peers and colleagues from around the world and pick up on some of these issues and maybe some of these topics, uh, some of these questions that we've had so far can be a good form of, um, of discussion, if you like. Um, so I'm just going to end the meeting in a moment and start this next one. Um, so Salah, can I hand over to you while I go to the breakout room and get ready to welcome the guests there? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, oh, yeah, before I go ahead and thank everyone uh, for being on this webinar. Um, I mean, one thing I want to clarify to everybody, and there was a slide I was missing on my first presentation, was the um, our role, you know, protecting our webinar uh, via Zoom. So just to make sure everyone knows that our meetings and, and webinars are encrypted by default. Um, we've created obviously uh, waiting rooms uh, for attendees. So those that have uh, surpassed the 100 registration list that we have, uh, we put them on hold. Um, the webinar that you see is, in a, is locked and the meeting that is gonna be held after this will be uh, in a locked uh, meeting. Um, what comes of the webinar, we've recorded it on our side, so we will be able to share it. Um, what, what comes with regards to the PPTs, of course, as always, we'll need to get authorization from our fantastic presenters um, uh, uh, and, and obviously get authorization from them. Um, and yeah, uh, I mean, obviously this webinar has been password protected as well and only individuals with a given email domain were allowed to join. So we have put all measures here to ensure that the uh, uh, Zoom webinar that we've held right now and the Zoom networking uh, meeting uh, after this webinar is done um, is well protected.